Hello, this is Jörg Lissmer once again from YouTube channel Juggler66, continuing the reading of the book Rulers of Evil from F. Tapasorsi. And we are now still in um, chapter 11 of Rulers of Evil, called The 13 Articles Concerning Military Art. Um, where we stopped, I just go back uh, a little bit to the top of the page, uh, 113 in the PDF to the conversation that Sun Tzu has with the Chinese Emperor at that time. To hear you speak, said the King, you would even inspire women to have the feelings of warriors. You would train them to bear arms. Yes, Prince, replied Sun Tzu in a firm voice, and I beg your Majesty to be assured of it. The King, who in the circumstances in which he found himself was no longer entertained by the customary amusements of court, took advantage of this opportunity to find a new sort of amusement. He said, quote, Bring me 180 of my wives. Unquote. He was obeyed, and the princesses appeared. Among them there were two in particular whom the king loved tenderly. They were placed ahead of the others. Quote, we will see, unquote, said the king, smiling. We will see, Sun Tzu, if you will be true to your word. I make you general of these new troops. All throughout my palace you need only choose the place which seems the most comfortable to give them military training. When they are sufficiently instructed, you will let me know, and I will come myself to render justice to them and to your talent." Unquote. The general sensed the ridicule of the role he was asked to play. But he did not back down, and instead appeared quite satisfied by the honor bestowed on him by the king, not only by allowing him to see his wives, but also by putting them under his direction. Quote, I will do well with them, sire, unquote. he said in an assured tone. Quote, and I hope that soon your majesty will have cause to be satisfied with my services. At the very least, your majesty will be convinced that Sun Tzu is not a man who takes risks." Unquote. Once the king had retired to his apartments, the, warriors, the warrior thought only of executing his commission. He asked for weapons and all the military equipment needed for his newly created soldiers. While waiting for everything to be ready, he led his troop into one of the courtyards of the palace which seemed the best suited for his work. Soon the items he had requested were brought to him. Sun Tzu then spoke to the princesses, quote, Here you are, he said, under my direction and my orders. You must listen to me attentively and obey me in whatever I command you to do. That is the first and most essential military law. Make sure you won't break it. By tomorrow I want you to perform exercises. Uh, and I exclude no one from my offer including the most mutinous, the most cowardly, and the weakest of men." Unquote. Um, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong page here, just give me a second. Okay, the page didn't go the way I wanted, so I'm gonna repeat um, this last quote from Sun Tzu when he spoke to the princesses. Quote, Here you are, he said, under my directions and my orders. You must listen to me attentively and obey me in whatever I command you to do. That is the first and most essential military law. Make sure you don't break it. By tomorrow I want you to perform exercises before the king and I intend for them to be done perfectly." Unquote. Where have we heard that before? Under my direction and my orders, you must listen attentively and obey me in whatever I command you to do. Isn't that exactly what is asked of the Jesuits to do with the orders of the Supreme General of the Order of the Society of Jesus? Papa Nero, the Black Pope? There you see again these pagan roots, because Chinese were pagans, of course. And the Jesuits used the same stuff, because they come from the pagan Knights Templars, as we've learned earlier. After those words, he strapped on their swords, put spears in their hands, divided them into two groups, and put one of the favorite princesses at the head of each. 
Once that arrangement was made, he began his instructions in these terms. Quote, Can you tell the difference between your chest and your back and your right hand from your left hand? Answer me. Unquote. At first the only response he received was some bursts of laughter. But he remained silent and very serious. Yes, of course, the ladies then replied in one voice. If that is so, resumed Sun Tzu, then listen carefully to what I am going to say. When the drum strikes only one beat, you will remain as you are now, only paying attention to what is before your chest. When the drum strikes two beats, you must turn so that your chest is in the place where your right hand was before. If instead of the two beats you hear three, you must turn so that your chest is precisely where your left hand was before. But when the drum strikes four beats, you must turn so that your chest is where your neck, uh, where your back was, and your back will be where your chest was. What I just said may not be clear enough. Let me explain. A single drum beat means that you must not change your position, and you must be on guard. Two beats mean you must turn right. Three beats mean you must turn left and four beats mean you must make a half turn. I will explain even more. This is the order I shall follow. First I will strike one beat. At that signal you will be ready to receive my orders. A few moments later I will strike two beats. Then, all together, you will turn to the right, with gravity. After which I will not strike three beats but four, and you will make a half turn. I will then have you return to your first position and, as before, I will strike one beat. At the first signal, be ready. Then I will strike not two beats but three and you will turn left. At four beats you will complete the half turn. Have you well understood what I am saying? If you have any difficulties you have but to speak to me of them and I shall attempt to explain the matter. We have understood replied the ladies. If that is so, responded Sun Tzu, I will begin. Do not forget that the sound of the drum takes the place of the general's voice, but he is the one who is giving you these orders. After repeating his instructions three times, Sun Tzu again aligned his small army, after which he had the drum strike one beat. At that sound all the ladies began to laugh. At two drum beats they laughed even louder. Ever serious, the general spoke to them thus, quote, It is possible that I did not explain clearly enough the instructions I gave you. If that is so, it is my fault. I will attempt to remedy it by, uh, to remedy it by speaking to you in a way that is more accessible to you. And at once he repeated the lesson three times in other terms. And then we will see, he added, if you obey me any better. He had the drum strike one beat and then two. Seeing him, <coughs> seeing him look so serious and given the strange situation they found themselves in, the ladies forgot to obey him. After attempting in vain to stop the laughter that was choking them, they finally let it burst forth loudly. Sun Tzu was in no way disconcert, uh, disconcerted, but in the same tone he had used when speaking to them before, he said, quote, If I had not explained myself clearly, or if you had not assured me in unison that you understood what I said, you would in no way be guilty. But as I spoke to you clearly as you admitted yourselves, why did you not obey? You deserve punishment and military punishment. Among the makers of war, whoever does not obey the orders of a general deserves death. Therefore, you will die. After that short preamble, Sun Tzu ordered the women to form, uh, who formed the two lines to kill the two who were leading them. Just then, one of the men whose job it was to guard the women, seeing that the warrior was not joking, ran to warn the king to what, to what was happening. The king sent someone to Sun Tzu to forbid him to go any farther and in particular 
from mistreating the two women he loved the best and without whom he could not live. The general listened with respect to the words that were spoken on behalf of the king, but he refused to bow down to his wishes. Go tell the king, he replied, that Sun Tzu believes him to be, reason to be too reasonable and too just to think he might have changed his mind so soon, and that he truly wishes to be obeyed in what you have just told me on his behalf. The prince is the lawmaker. He would not give orders which would sully the dignity he vested in me. He asked me to, to train 180 of his wives as soldiers. He made me their general. The rest is up to me. They disobeyed me. They will die. Unquote. So saying, he pulled out his sword, and with the same calmness he had his he had displayed until then, he cut off the heads of the two who were leading the others. He immediately put two others in their place and had the drum strike the various beats he had explained to his troops. And it was as if those women had been professional soldiers all their lives, they made their turns silently and impeccably. Sansu spoke to the envoy. Go tell the king, he said that his wives now know how to drill. Now I can lead them to war, make them affront all sorts of perils and even make them pass through water and fire. When the king learned what had happened, he was penetrated by the deepest sorrow. With a great sigh he said, quote, Thus have I lost what was dearest to me in this world. Have that foreigner returned to his country. I do not want him, nor his services. What have you done, barbarian? How can I go on living? And so on, and so on, and so on. As unconsolable as the king was, time and circumstances soon made him forget his loss. His enemies were ready to descend upon him. He asked Sun Tzu to return, make him general of his armies, and with his help he destroyed Chu Kingdom, uh, the, the Chao Kingdom. Those of, this, of his neighbors, who had formerly been the most worrisome, were now penetrated by fear at the mere mention of the glorious acts of Sun Tzu, and thought only of living peacefully under the protection of a prince who had such a man at his service. This introduction confirms that Paul III's war declaration, Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, is about protecting the life of the nation, with which is the Roman Church. Protecting the Church may require the superior general to sacrifice his soldiers, his citizens, and if need be, his sovereign, the Pope. In a very real sense, the great general is so inscrutably alone, so omnipotent, that he is at war with everyone, sacrificing his own, just as Saturn, the grandfather god of Rome, devoured his own children. In order to defeat an enemy short of coming to blows, this is a great general's legitimate obligation. Sun Tzu writes, quote, Without giving battle, without spilling a drop of the enemy's blood, Without even drawing a sword, the clever general succeeds in capturing cities. Without setting foot in a foreign kingdom, he finds the means to conquer them. He acts in such a way that those who are inferior to him can never guess his intentions. He has them change location, even taking them to rather difficult places where they must work and suffer. When a clever general goes into action, the enemy is already defeated. When he fights, he alone must do more than this entire army, not through the strength of his arm, but through his prudence, his manner of commanding, and above all his ruses. Unquote. Lorenzo Ricci's most compelling ruse was disestablishing the Society of Jesus, a campaign that mimicked the collapse of the Knights Templar four centuries earlier. With astonishing precision, the disestablishment ran 
concurrently with the escalation of hospitalities between the American colonies and the British Crown. It was an amazing juggle that spanned 17 years. It saw Ritchie's secret liaisons in and around the British Parliament by legislation that inflamed his secret liaisons in and around the American colonial governments to formulate a culture of rebellion. It saw his own visible army, mute and defenseless, systematically assaulted by the European powers and eventually suppressed, quote, for all eternity, unquote, by a 1773 papal brief, ah, or bull, as it was. Once the stage was set and the action scripted, it saw the general slip into deeper cover to let the protestant powers exhaust themselves in wars that within a single generation resulted in a glorious Roman presence where once England had reigned. Clandestine military operations inspired by the ingenuity of Sun Tzu are virtually impossible to document. If strategic notes were taken, if written commands were given, they were carefully destroyed. Such that survive may have been spared in order to misinform. The mouses of covert operatives are kept shut out of a simple desire to stay alive. Sensational disclosures, too, we can presume to be misinformational. To determine that Lorenzo Ricci did in fact mount any clandestine operation at all requires a careful evaluation of circumstantial evidence. Was there an outcome that benefited him and his sovereign? Did he have the authority, the motive, the resources, the ability and the opportunity to do what created the outcome? As to outcome, English-speaking Protestantism did in fact violently divide and the victorious party moreover invited Roman Catholic religionists to participate in its political government. As to authority for waging war against Protestantism, Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae authorized the general to prosecute enemies of the Roman faith. As to motive, the Jesuit oath spiritually obligated the extirpation of Protestantism in both America and Great Britain. As to resources, the Black, uh, the black Papacy, even as its marge, uh, martial strategy brought its own organization to apparent oblivion, had instant call on the vast reserve of Roman Catholic wealth. As the old Spanish proverb goes, quote, Don dinero es muy católico, unquote. Ritchie's ability to direct an international covert operation was stated and defined by the momentous publication of the Thirteen Articles in what was then the language of international diplomacy. Finally, a man commanding unlimited financial resources and unlimited obedience of an unlimited supply of well-trained personnel enjoys unlimited opportunity to do anything possible and some things deemed impossible. To deny that Lorenzo Ricci orchestrated American independence may be to ignore his talent and demean his office. Let us, now, uh, let us move now to the next chapter and begin our examination of how the general did it. And this is something I will have to leave you wanting for more because this was a short broadcast. I'm only finishing chapter 11. I will not go into chapter 12 because that is quite long called Lorenzo Ricci's War and I can assure you that is a chapter that you surely do not want to miss my reading on or probably reading yourself. Uh, you can decide that for yourself because as you know the link to download the book is provided in the description box of the video you can download the book for free, it doesn't cost you even one cent because it's available as a PDF on the internet. The same that I have because I don't buy all the books that I read but I look for them in PDF files. And of course it is possible for you uh, to even print the book and uh, Walt Stickel spoke about that on numerous broadcasts on Hour of the Truth that how he learned how to make from a PDF a readable and printable book and you can print it for yourself. 
So when you say, I don't have the money to buy the book, well, it's okay. Download the PDF, put it on a stick, go to a printer, let it print out, and for a few bucks you have the whole book printed as it should be. I will stop here now at a little 20 minutes and we will see how it, uh, how it progresses in the future. I am looking very much forward to read chapter 12 and I will be shortly back to do so. And uh, I can tell you already now, you have to really sit on the top of your chair. Lorenzo Ricci's War is one hell of a chapter in Rulers of Evil. So, thank you very much for listening. Until next time, God bless you and bye-bye.